Hello, everybody. You're about to meet Angela Blanchard. She is currently a senior fellow at the Waston Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. She is also president emerita at Neighborhood Centers, now Baker Ripley. As you will hear, Baker Ripley experienced phenomenal growth under her leadership. Angela wrote a wonderful book about the foundations of that growth entitled Appreciative Community Building. It was published by Baker Ripley Community Builders. Angela has been my friend for many moons. I wanted you to hear her because she embodies value-based leadership. Everything she does, all of her efforts, both personal and professional, stem from a deep-rooted set of values. Those values were throughout her work at Baker Ripley. I believe those values underpinned why Baker Ripley took off and gained an international reputation under her leadership. Two of her values stand out, and I hope you will listen for them. First, she has a deep and abiding respect in the capacity of people to grow and flourish with the right kind of support. That respect comes from a deep place within her. Second, she understands systems and that everything is interconnected. What you do here impacts what happens over there. She doesn't just plan for what part of a system that she's working on. If she's working on one part, she consciously and deliberately is impact on the other parts. Because of this, she deliberately builds systems, processes, and infrastructures to support her work. She doesn't just want to do good. She builds a platform on which it's possible to do good. So here's Angela. So yeah, my memory of meeting you is, is a little bit more along the lines of um, I had great, uh, great ambition for neighborhood centers now known as Baker Ripley. And, um, and I had a sense of what was going to be necessary to grow the organization. Um, but I was also, <laughs> I felt a, a bit alone because many of my views about what could be done weren't shared uh, by colleagues. And, um, and, uh, and they weren't even shared by my boss at the time who I think said basically, why would I want a bunch of social workers in my organization mm. telling me how to run things? Yeah, I remember you I saying. think of so many reasons why we would want Jean and a bunch of social workers in our organization. I had a long list, but I agreed. I agreed, oh, what a great sacrifice to be the point person. And uh, that was a beginning of a great friendship, but I really want to say thank you for believing in me through thick and thin for decades. I mean, you've been a great personal and prof personal friend and a wonderful professional support and colleague. And you all always believed in my ideas. And well, well, let's get there. Let's, let's tell how those ideas evolved. Okay, so I want to go back to your childhood because yeah. you have a fascinating story of how you learned leadership. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I'm the oldest of eight kids in a Cajun family. And my parents had eight children before they were 30. Or, so, so um, yeah, so my parents were married in June of 1953. In June of 1954, I was born. Slightly less than a year later, my sister was born. And there you have it. So I always say good Catholics, no rhythm. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what it meant, in Cajun culture, the oldest daughter becomes always like this third parent. And so my parents would always just say, Angela and the kids, I never had this notion that I was one of the group. I, and, and I was also responsible. I was told I was responsible for what happened to everybody 
anybody smaller than me. And of course, everyone was. So literally, actually, through, all the way through high school, I was the tallest person in my family. So, so when people say, when did you learn about leadership? I, well, you know, at 13, my parents had to go, they worked and they had left the house and they said, oh, you're in charge. And, you know, obviously I had all the responsibility and no power. So it's a great lesson because you have to get people to do things when you can't make them. And um, <laughs> that's delightful. Of course, my parent, my brothers and sisters had absolutely no regard for that role. It was just like, uh, it'll all be her fault. We can do whatever we want and it will be her fault. <laughs> it just kind of how it happened. So Bottom line, I just kind of ended up with an overdeveloped sense of responsibility, which has really served me well. It's, and I, 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 learned, I learned to consider every action's impact on everyone around me. I learned, it was just ingrained in me to think, how do we get here and back with everyone? You know, yeah, to the store, you had to take them to the store. If we all went to the store to spend our, you know, nickels and pennies and whatever, we had to get there and back. And it, it included the two-year-old and the 12-year-old that didn't want to listen to me and everybody in between. And, you know, I, I people will, you know, will want to say, oh, my gosh, how tragic is that? She never had a real child. And she, that's all malarkey because... Actually, it was such a great training ground for the responsibilities of leadership and being a real adult in the world, because really everything we do does have an impact on others. And um, so I'm yeah. <laughs> so early thinking about that whole philosophy of everything we do has an impact on everybody else. That seems to be the thing that's following you. Yeah. Okay, so I want to ask you now, you mentioned that you're Cajun. And you have talked to me at length about uh, the Cajuns, the difference between Cajuns and Creole, which a lot of people don't understand, and how Cajun came to New Orleans, I mean, to Louisiana, through mm -hmm. oppression. So your, your exposure to that, tell just not the whole thing, but just tell us. Yeah, that's a, that. a big historical story. Um, but... So, you know, I, I had grown, growing up in, in, in just sort of like as a Cajun person, first of all, most people think Cajun means you were born and lived in Louisiana, and Louisiana is what it means to be Cajun, but in the truest sense, it means you're a descendant from the Acadians who were French people who had left France uh, because of religious oppression and then in the 1700s were, you know, uh, unceremoniously uh, deported uh, from, uh, from Acadia by the English, because as the Cajun story goes, instead of swearing allegiance to the English monarchy, they merely swore at the monarchy. So they were loaded on ships and, and uh, you know, at the time, in the mid 1700s, mid to late 1700s, the the 13 colonies were struggling, and they weren't really keen on having a bunch of destitute, deported people. And so they were they many of those ships sailed until they were dumped in South Louisiana. And you know, m most ch ch school children grow up learning about reading the the poem Evangeline by Longfellow, which is the separation of two lovers in this Le Grand Dersmont, which is the, the big deportation. And um, so, so what Cajuns have as a legacy from all of that is this language and culture and food and celebration and traditions, but also, also this massively <laughs> inculcated like mistrust and lack of reverence for everything official, uh, officialdom we find highly entertaining. And we view all manner of officialdom with some degree of skepticism. Ah. So, 
Okay, so so you okay, so let here's the picture. The oldest responsible for kids who don't want to listen to you and growing <laughs> up in a culture with a healthy sense of irreverence. Absolutely. Celebration and irreverence. Miss Celebration. Oh yeah, you yeah, celebration and irreverence. And a whole sense of, you know, I laughingly say, and it's still true. It's like it's true even in the next generation in our family. You tell us that something cannot be done, or you tell us that we mustn't do it, or we tell us, or you tell us that that um, this is a rule, and the entire family, everyone sits back. You can see everybody thinking, well, that could be true. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we are not seducible <laughs> by, by any of that, you know, grant, any grand thing. Uh, we're kind of like, it could be true or not. Uh, because we came from people where a lot of what was written and dictated was not for them, did not celebrate them, did not lift them up. So, um, we look at all of that and say, well, that might be, might be great. But why okay. Not? So that's part of what you and I have in common. My father, for my father, especially whom I soon got it from his father, there's always a way and all you need is a better strategy. You can, you can get it. You can get whatever you want. All you need is a, the right strategy. Yes. And so that's the same thing as it could be true or it could not be true. Maybe, maybe not. It's like when my mother said to my brothers and sisters, you're going to all stay in the backyard. I don't want to see one person going through that gate. And so, of course, my sister and my brothers climbed the fig tree, got on the roof, walked across the roof and climbed down the other side. No one went through that gate. So <laughs> pretty much we had when we had a goal or an agenda, and it's still true, it's hard to stop us. Okay, so let's skip childhood. We're not going to do college. We're not going to we'll skip on all of that. You're mm -hmm. now at neighborhood centers. Yeah. So what uh, what really attracted me to neighborhood centers now, Baker Ripley, was this kind of um, you know identification with people who were in some form of economic social struggle. So in our family, we just scrapped together everything we could to make our way out of multiple generations of poverty, ignorance, alcoholism, isolation. You know, this was our, this was what we sought to overcome and in a conscious way. And I, I mean, I really still every day drawn to people who are trying to build and craft a life different than the one they were born to. And, you know, so for me, the first introduction I had uh, to Baker Ripley was meeting Felix Fraga in, a, in, a, in, in one of the back hallways of the old Ripley house. And uh, know, wait a minute, Ange, uh, cause I'm afraid people won't get that name. Felix, F-E-L-I-X Fraga, F-R-A-G-A. And I do well remember uh, Felix. Yeah, and how could anyone not remember Felix? I mean, Felix embodied everything about uh, community engagement, everything about community development. He was the embodiment of service to community. His belief, his intense belief that you cultivate all these healthy things in neighborhoods that people thought were troubled. So, you know, there was this great energy there, but there was also just, as you observed when you came, uh, it was a financially fragile organization. Yeah. Lots of so, let's, Lots let's, of I, I want people to picture it and the services that you provided at the time. You, uh, you said, I remember you said y'all provided services from womb to tomb. So describe what Neighborhood Centers is, what it does, what it was doing, uh, and ethnically, with who is the population you're serving, all of that. So let, you mentioned, Jean, having an affinity and awareness of the role of community centers and settlement houses 
So a great deal of social work actually bloomed and blossomed out of Settlement House and the Settlement House movement. Yes. And it was that that essence of Settlement Houses, the, 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 the core story about Settlement Houses that really attracted me to Baker Ripley. What I saw there through Felix, through Ripley House, through the other centers was, you know, people in neighborhoods creating welcoming places for those who are there and those who are coming. And I feel like there's never going to be a time, particularly never in the foreseeable future, when that's not going to be really important, that we have these places of welcome, these landing places and on-ramps for people. And so, you know, how to create the, the challenge was how do we make it financially viable? How do we create a strong backbone for an organization that could continue to evolve and grow with Houston? Um, you know, okay, so hang on. You said three things that they need to be unpacked. First is uh, understanding the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... And I had asked you, describe the ethnicity, average income level, talk about the neighborhood itself. Well, there were so many neighborhoods because we were in multiple neighborhoods. And um, I knew from previous work that, you know, the way to understand a neighborhood was to talk to the people who lived in it. Because I had lived in many neighborhoods that had been characterized by others as troublesome and problematic and, you know, the lack scaps, needs, want, poor, et cetera. I mean, you now I heard it all. And, and yet my experience of those neighborhoods had been different. And, and so I was very keenly tuned into the notion that in every neighborhood, you know, you're going to find these signs of, connection and life and generosity and celebration and history and and all the things we associate with being a good neighbor. Um, it's been popular for people to say, oh, there's no there there. Um, there's always a there. If there are people, there's a there there. Whether or not you can see it depends on your lenses. Um, but so we were well, you know, I was seeing an organization work, work working in multiple neighborhoods and each of the neighborhoods having its own idea about what it meant to be, you know, to, to be in Acres Homes or to be in East End or to be in Fifth Ward. You know, what does that identity mean and what is the history that's important to you and what's the connection today that matters? That's okay. I'm, I'm going to say what you said differently because I want to make sure people get that because I think what you just said is really so important. A lot of people think of low-income neighborhoods as dysfunctional and they put dysfunctional words on them. They put words like crime and they put words like lazy and all of that. And my experience of neighborhoods low-income, moderate, low-moderate income neighborhoods. It's just what you're saying. They are neighbors. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's... <laughs> so we have to dial all the way back in order to talk about this with, you know, and say how we view any group of people, whether it's a neighborhood or a population or a race or an ethnic group or a gender or whatever, has to do with, you know, the filters we put on. So we have this whole notion in this country that, you know, if you need help, it signals that you're broken or flawed in some way. And we can't, our, our paradigm for working with neighborhoods that we deem low income or poor is from a lack scaps, needs, wants. And, you know, I mean, this is, of course, what probably people associated most with me was, you know, this notion that everything was broken in that neighborhood. You know, we could, we, we were compelled, we were 
it was demanded of us as a human services social sector organization that we generate reports that really detailed all the problems in places where we were working. And because uh, we were funded by the federal government and by uh, 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 foundations. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, let's just be clear. It's not just the federal government that does this. Okay. Everybody does it. Yes, all Every, of them. It suits the Western philosophy and American narrative to just characterize any struggling group of people as having some individual or collective failure, not as some kind of byproduct of, you know, a failure of policy or our lack of perfection in the allocation of resources, right? Right. So, you know, high school dropout, non-English speaking, unsure, uninsured, low birth rate, and we could rattle everybody knew all the problems. You know, when we went into Gulfton, highest juvenile crimes that code in the country. And, you know, it's kind of, so, you know, having both lived in neighborhoods that had been characterized that way and, you know, and actually just my sort of gut level, the regard with which I was taught to, you know, my, the, the, the inherent respect for people that I was taught from childhood on made me think, mm, isn't there another way to talk about why we invest that is not based on find the problem, diagnose the problem, band-aid the problem? I was so sick and tired of it. And I saw that at, it felt like a form of violence to the spirit to persist in describing these places that were actually as you said, full of life and generosity and community and people behaving as real neighbors. And yet we had to, we were supposed to talk about them as these broken places. So that just had to end for me in order to stay congruent, you know, with, with my beliefs and how I really saw people. Yes. But that and was hard. That that's why I wanted neighborhood centers because I saw that you saw that. I was totally impressed that you saw that because I, I uh, my experience in neighborhoods in New York City and Richmond and other places. So Thank you saw that and it was tremendous. You knew it. You knew it. Of yes. course you knew, and, you knew it. Yeah. yeah. I'm a social worker community organizer so I understood that completely. So yeah. So I want you to talk about then how you took being sick of that, being sick of the pathology diagnosis. Yeah. Turned it on his head and developed this tremendous model to grow neighborhood centers with, not for, but with the community. I, oh. I only do this because I love you. <laughs> you know, I'm doing this. All right. Yeah. So it was not just me, it was a lot of us. There were a lot of people hungry as I was. And I say a lot of people in this state, in this country, that really at some gut level knew that what was being done was not quite the truth. Um, that, that knew that every program based on a problem was somehow that always ended up in the cul-de-sac of misery. So it, I was, I, yes, I knew it, but I, my job became to find others that knew it too. And that, okay, so challenge number one is can you find funders that embrace these community as places worthy of investment? So, because we, of course, behave very differently toward people we believe in and places we believe in versus those we think are problematic. So the first thing was, could we tell a story that, that to reach congruence, so the story I tell about you and the story I tell with you and the story you tell about yourself, one story. Oh, that's magnificent. Keep it, going. It, that was the integrity, Jean, that we 
that was the integrity that we found our way to that the only thing we could say in a campaign was something that somebody in the community had said or something we could say in front of the community and they would recognize it as true. So what funders would hear and what we would say in the community was the same story. And, and that it was um, moving those things together to not use language. And, and I think I've shared with you before Part of what really pushed me toward this was the memory, the college of reading a social work text book and, and there were case studies in it. And I remember reading this sort of dispassionate um, account of a family, you know, poor and alcoholism and too many children. And, and it was my family. Oh my and goodness. I, this sort of sick horror that it, and I remember putting my hand really quickly over the page, like, and the thought I had is I would never want my parents to read that someone had written like this about us. And obviously it wasn't us, but it was close enough. And I still horrified. And, and I still, even if I think about it now, I feel horrified because I saw my parents struggle and overcome almost unbelievable odds to accomplish what they did with us. And I saw that in every neighborhood in Houston. And to think that we took all that hunger and all that striving and the only story we could tell about it was how it didn't, I just, I can't bear it. It's like, I can't. So, you know, to, um, it was Tim Skaggs at an ALF thing when I was saying one time, I can't take this anymore. There's got to be a way, I mean, some proven way, some, you know, validated way of studying people and communities that is not based on problems and pathology, but it's instead... And he said, oh, yes, it's called appreciative inquiry. Oh, you heard about that. I know Tim. Let's uh, uh, point to Tim Skaggs. Yes, I know Tim. So I was like, hallelujah. And uh, I looked it up that night. The next day, I was like, I was like, gathered six of my best team members that could like to entertain a new idea. And I said, this, this is how we're going to have to try this right now, like today. Like we have to start now. And we stumbled and we, you know, we were inept. We were struck. You know, we, we had to learn and we had to learn how to be in community that way and inside the agency that way. But, but for us, it kind of opened the door to be, um, to be in integrity to be able to talk about the pe people that we worked with the way we really saw them in a way that um, honored them and the work we were doing. It was so, uh, it was great. It was great. And I'm pretty stubbornly dogmatic on all of that still. <laughs> Just Okay, so do you want, uh, let me see. What I want people to understand is that you used and infused, and I mean a plural you, you plus your staff, mm -hmm. infused appreciative inquiry throughout all parts of the organization. You yeah. hired people in an appreciative manner. I remember yeah. one of my former students applied for a job with neighborhood centers, came back to me and said, I can't believe this job interview. It was unlike anything I've ever had. They, they asked me about what I was going to bring to the table. He, he said it was, and he couldn't describe it because the questions had, you know, lost, had flown away. But I heard from different people throughout the uh, Houston community that y'all were using it. So should I show the model now? Do you want me to screen share or do you want to talk about it some more? How do you want to proceed? Um, so, so you brought up several things. <laughs> um, so one thing is, as we, 
we turn we we as we crafted new questions and new ways of discerning and gathering insights through appreciative inquiry about communities, it soon became obvious to us that we had to take the approach we were taking with communities and move it into the organization. And my one of my dear colleagues, Ann Helbig, says, if we had tried to undergo a change um, project, you know, and bring that in for us, we would have never been motivated enough to do it for ourselves the way we're motivated to do it for our communities. But in doing it for our communities, the necessity of doing it internally and using it as we, as we recruited our board members and our staff members and our consultants and whomever we work with, it was working then from the standpoint of strengths. You know, appreciative inquiry is all about understanding what makes us as individuals and communities, what makes us energized and whole and healthy and strong. And in, in, in crafting questions that get to the heart of what matters most to us. So, yeah. So yes, very much interviewed very differently once we were uh, seeking those answers from people as they came in. Okay, so what you're saying is you applied appreciative inquiry in the community first. You then said, uh-oh, we have to do it ourselves so that it's part of who we are. And so you brought it internal as well. And yeah. bringing it in internal means you will strengthen in bringing it back out into the community. I think so. I think, uh, but it was also challenging and there were still people that would, you know, there would be still people that connected with us that would some say sarcastically like, oh, I'm not drinking that Kool-Aid or, you know. So, I mean, because of course we think when we wrap ourselves in cynicism, uh, there's a sort of superiority to that. Uh, we assume that a person more cynical, less positive has a greater handle on reality uh, um, and, you know, I was always very entertained by that. You know, I just allow people to go on, um, you know, saying whatever they wanted. And then a lot of people confused it also with positive thinking. So, no, it's radically not that. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about this. Okay. Sentences like that. We could, I'm getting excited. Uh, okay. So positive thinking. Okay, let me wipe my eye here. This eyes water. So first, let's talk about the difference between what you're talking about, appreciative inquiry and positive thinking. Yeah. So I, I, I share this, I talk about this a lot with my students because students are, are really being educated in a system that is in the academic world, which is largely kind of skews toward criticism as a way to understand things. So, um, and there's a great deal to criticize about both our political system and our economic system and our social systems. And so a lot of students are like seeing what's flawed about the systems we've built and they want to talk about it. And Appreciative inquiry doesn't shut down discussion about what is flawed and problematic and painful and cruel and devastating. Far from it. Appreciative inquiry is the, is the quest for understanding what is there to work with. What do we have to work with in the way of strengths, resources, power, etc., that can be activated and arranged in a way that allows us to free ourselves from the things that are not working. And so I, I, I often say, I still believe in some ways that maybe the most appreciative inquiry type question I ever asked was Nelson Mandela as he emerges from prison, 27 years of really his personal imprisonment and oppression 
and then his lifetime of witnessing the cruelties of apartheid South Africa. And his question is, how shall we come together and move forward as one country? Um, not let's forget about everything that ever happened. And what came out of that was not a collective amnesia of whitewashing, but the reconciliation hearings. Right. And to so we, we are, the, and we have a desperate need as a species. Our quest now really should be for how do we, how do we uh, have a reckoning um, with um, the cruelties and problems of the past that allows us to come together and move forward. Not a whitewashing, not burying it, not erasing. Um, but it's like the old Gnostic gospel thing, that which we bring forth shall save us. That which we do not bring forth shall de destroy us. So I think appreciative inquiry, you know, it, it, real practitioners, it's the art of bringing forth that which can save us. So I, you know, I, I see, well, let me pause there because I, you know, okay. I really want to respect what, what you and your audience would most want to know. Okay. So what you're saying, I'm trying to, I'm going back and forth with this model and whether we want to do that or not. Okay. What you're saying is that appreciative inquiry seeks, uh, uses questions to seek out what is it in this community, in this organization, in this nation, in whatever, what resources do they have to build on so that whatever's in the way of progress, those resources can be harnessed to yeah. move forward. Yeah, so we can work toward wholeness and healing and yeah, what can what is there to work with? Yeah. So we can work towards wholeness. Okay, so that was one thing, the contrast between that and positive thinking. The second question, and I really have got it downright excited when you start talking about it, is the cynicism. I yeah. know so many people who think they are so smart if they can find some fatal flaw in whatever idea somebody has. You personally, we know, encountered a lot of cynicism. Oh, yeah. How did you, as a leader, deal with that? How could you use a, bring an appreciative inquiry approach to your organization, to building it, to community, in the face of people who think they're smarter than you, if they can point out what's wrong. So back when my hair was still red, I was referred to as the redheaded flake, <laughs> you know, at, uh, at neighborhood centers and uh, a lot of other unkind things. Um, you know, there's a kind of, if all you do is espouse a philosophy, um, then yes, I mean, I think there's a kind of uh, questioning of, well, great, this sounds wonderful, but what does it look like on the ground? And so one thing that's always a source of humility for me is that it is extremely difficult to craft you know, to actually draw upon what is available, to craft it so that it works. I mean, that's the art of running an organization. That's the art of building an institution. It you create this, this capacity to actually make something work on a set of principles, right? Right. And that just will keep you really humble because on any given day, you just hope you're at 51% of it's working, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's also you, what, what do you, what did you used to say? What you don't work on works a loose. So hey, there we go. That's working it. on it every day. This is gardening. This isn't like, you know, you build it and you walk away. If you view organizations as we do as living things, and it's an ongoing cultivation process, and one in which you are constantly aligning yourself and inviting others 
and you know it's a tending process it's so so we we also had to create within the organization something i know that you uh, long respected was an organizational development model because we had to build an organization that worked and could be funded and could last. Okay, so I'm going to screen share that model. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and I want you to talk it through, talk us through this. I will say that I thought when you showed this to me, I thought this is brilliant. So here <laughs> goes. I really always appreciated that you were both interested in and 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 positive about my ideas, <laughs> because I think um, uh, people just would would want to have an opinion about the outcome of things without really wanting to know why I did a thing the way I did. Um, I had this theory, you know, kind of based, it was, it was sort of stemmed from systems thinking, which is the macro and the micro are the same. So we kind of fundamentally grasp the common sense of Maslow's hierarchy, right? I mean, it, it, it's been justifiably criticized and in many indigenous communities, we wouldn't necessarily see a pyramid the way Maslow did it. But setting that aside for a minute, we did really understand in, in the social sector that basic needs had to be met if we were to actually work with individuals on anything beyond survival. And so there was a logic to this hierarchy of needs. And I thought if it applied to individuals, why would not it apply to collections of individuals? So I wanted to see if we could make an argument and treat our organization as if it were a person, a family, a community, and respect the need for the foundational and basic needs of the organization to be met. What, what really hurt me, Jean, and you and I saw this a lot, especially 70s, 80s, it was, it was just uh, rampant, is nonprofits really sort of people working there in some sort of sacrificial mode almost. You know, there were... I'm going to stop screen share for this because this is really important. I want... Yeah. Uh, so people working in some sort of sacrificial mode, you know, not being paid well, not having the tools they needed, you know, the roof leaking on their over their heads. Here we were, you know, just this, this kind of, you know, really mission-driven but not substantiated or supported by an organization that could reliably carry out the delivery of services in line with those principles. And, you know, when you came to be with us, I mean, you were looking for where is the organization that has some sort of healthy way of interacting with one another the people they serve and the people that fund them that, that we could see some sort of healthy progress. So, so we were swimming upstream at that time in our organization when I was making arguments for automation, arguments for facility improvement, arguments for tools it, it, that people needed to do their jobs. And it was like, Remember all the fights about, oh, M&G, they spent all that money on M&G instead of services. And it was very difficult. Yeah, so let me, let me make sure people are with, with what you're saying, because this is so critical for nonprofits. Yeah. Nonprofits are expected to be broke by many funders. Yeah. And funders often give money for services, they want to, what I say is they want to feed the hungry child. They don't want to support the staff who are, who, are, who are feeding the hungry child. And they don't want to support the organization that has the building in which the hungry child comes to get the food. They don't want to support any of the stuff that, that makes it work. They just want to see the, the hungry child and feed the hungry child. And the staff expect, 
expect to be suffering martyrs. Yeah, yeah. That's a, just an incredibly offensive, just utterly offensive approach because those same funders will demand, uh, demand an almost ridiculous amount of documentation and support. So this is the, what I observed is a lot of nonprofits being funded into bankruptcy. Because here's your money. Now you're expected to provide all of it's supposed to go towards services. But oh, by the way, you still better provide an endless number of, of reports and give us your data and track your services and your demographics. And, and, you know, and you'll have to do it with pencil and paper because, of course, a computer would be a misuse of funds. So this is unconscionable. We would never expect we would we would absolutely know that any business organized that way would fail. It would almost fail instantly. Um, so um, what, you know, what happens in the nonprofit sector is any, any flagrant violation, any, you know, arimony and United Way scandal makes headlines forever. And then, you know, we're all supposed to be suffering because somebody spent too much money on office furniture and misused their, um, it really created completely inappropriate perks for themselves. So, th but this is nonsense because uh, we, don't, we don't expect every business to do without infrastructure and buildings and computers and systems and good data methods and and process design and and everything else because somebody did it wrong. Um, so, so that was hard. Just, so be clear. So this bottom part, you determined that if you are going to really deliver great services with the community, you had it to have this strong infrastructure. You had to have a platform, yes, Gene. As the basis, okay. You built a platform because, well, for one thing, um, you know, the part of the joy of working with the Obama administration was they recognized that we were all trying to take these disparate silo sources of funding and weave them into something coherent that made sense for communities. Um, but you know, that's, you can't count on anybody funding you the way that you need to deliver. So you have to have a platform, you have to perform the alchemy of drawing on all these disparate sources of support and funding and tracking them and reporting on them the way you're required to and building the platform for compliance and control over resources and support so that you can satisfy those really in the case, in our case, would have been dozens and dozens, hundreds really, uh, that was necessary. That's the stage we operate, that we built the stage so that we could perform a play on it uh, in a reliable way. It was challenging. <laughs> okay, so then the next phase of the model was the efficiency and effectiveness. Then you yeah. start to improve that. So when you look at the model, the, the foundation is comply because a failure to do so is a game over. You know, you don't get the funding, you can't account for it, you fail your audits, you misallocate either, you know, by, by, by lack of skill or ability, a federal, federal grant, you know, game over. So we didn't want any of that game over stuff. So we built the foundation. Then we move beyond compliance and control and we start looking at is what we're spending here on this process, on this product, on this service really rational. Like if, you know, I remember looking for example at what we were spending on an early childhood per unit cost for one particular program and how it compared to the most lauded early childhood program in the region, the one that people with money could pay for. And I'm thinking if these are the same, the quality should be too. So you start looking at efficiency and effectiveness. It's not just are we delivering, 
but is it rational the resources used is that are the are the dollars being spent that uh, the, the dollars we're spending to help someone navigate their immigration status uh, are those rational is that a rational use of dollars uh, per person per service per unit so this is just good discipline to check yourself and to check what you're doing against uh, what the people you're serving would value most in that circumstance. Okay, so come on up to the creativity and the leadership. And so I, 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 I find our American narrative about in, innovation and creativity just utterly entertaining because we only have we have this like story, two guys go in a garage and they tinker and come out with this brilliant idea like all by themselves as if none of the work that led up to that existed and they are the heroes. So this is in no way how innovation really happens. But nonprofits have such a difficult time. I was talking with someone this week about there's no hardly anything that could be considered you know, venture capital in the nonprofit sector. A lot of funders will mouth those words or will talk about, oh, we're looking for innovation and new ideas. And yet what they then require of you is a hundred pages that promise that it will definitely work just the way you say it will, no matter what. So nonprofits who strive for creativity and innovation which really a lot comes from the integration of what they're doing with other services, really have to do that on a foundation of, you know, solid infrastructure, good product and service delivery. And then on top of that, you can actually then uh, not just risk, but push for innovation and creativity saying, look, we deliver and here's how, um, on this foundation of delivery, we could do something with far more impact. Um, it, it is a joy to me when we reach the point when we could strive for something creative that could be done on that the existing platform. So now, on a, when you're thinking like an accountant, which I still occasionally do, <laughs> you know, we were just all we had to consider were the marginal costs of that innovation, not the entire structure that had to be built underneath it or that would support it, which had already been created. Okay, so what you're saying is, instead of planning for the cost of the innovation, you had to uh, think about the added cost the innovation brings since you already had the platform and the processes in place. So you're just looking at marginal increases in investment you're making for an experiment that resides on, lives on the stage already built. And that form of innovation. And then for us also, it was embracing the challenge of integrating what we were doing, with what others were doing. Um, and that, you know, to make a system work better. A lot of the actions that I contemplated, I actually contemplated them in the context of, for example, uh, the entire system that was serving seniors. You know, what does that system look like from the, from the seniors like us, Jean, that are healthy and active to, you know, the 101 year old person that is probably needs a little bit of assistance. Um, so that whole spectrum of services, you start to think about where should we act so that that whole system and spectrum works. So you have, you know, at that, on that third tier, you have different questions and you have a different set of considerations. Um, it might also be, you know, you look at the entire geography of the region and say 13 neighborhoods have asked us for a community center. Where shall we act that actually makes the region work better as opposed to, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So I want to translate this because a lot uh, for racial and social justice. Yeah. A lot of people who are going to listening are people who in their organizations are trying, want to implement and bring the organization towards greater internal equity, greater 
equity and services delivery. <laughs> Listen, that's what they want to do. They want to be where you were. You had the constraints of the funders. Some of, some of them do, some of them don't. But they still have the constraints of having managers or peers who can't see their vision of what's possible in their organization. Can you speak to how this model could help them? Um, so, uh, it, I think there is one healthy recent shift I would point to. So many decades have gone by during which the funders only focused on high-performing nonprofits, which really did not, did not resource a nonprofit that was organized around racial justice or equity and had at its core a set of principles and values that needed, needed uplifting that were all that everyone really would benefit from seeing this thing blossom and grow. But because it was small, because it was fragile as an organization, it's like we can't send our money there. So that they did one of two things. They did nothing. They just perpetuated the inequity by doing nothing. Or they selected an intermediary. And the intermediary, of course, always has an investment in keeping this organization fragile because, I mean, they're an intermediary. And if you're great, they won't need to stand between you and the funder anymore. And you'll stand on your own two feet, everything. Um, so I'm really, I'm really encouraged because there's some sign that funders are willing to undertake the challenge of identifying amongst smaller uh, organizations, grassroots, led by people of color, with a clear understanding of what equity would mean for their communities, for their people, the the reach into those or into those communities to serve and find those organizations and trust them. You know, the, believe what they tell you about what's needed. I, I find that hopeful. There's not enough of it as much as we might like but it's moving in that direction. Now for those organizations, here's where it gets challenging because they need to do a bit of institution building. And that doesn't sound very good to a person who says I'm a part of a movement. Right. So, you know, like, oh my God, I'm gonna be spending it again on, oh, I buy computers instead of powering the movement. And buying computers does power the movement. I think we've come a long way in understanding that. It is, if we do not like the way institutions are responding to caring for people that are dear to us, then we must create new institutions um, that really can and will do it. So institution building around a core set of principles and, that, and practices that value people previously not valued, we need those. And that means the people who lead them have to get beyond the movement into the institution building. And I find amongst a lot of my much beloved millennial leaders, and I do love them, you know, they don't like all of that institution building money, talking infrastructure stuff. They, because they, they fear it. They associate it with the institutions that shut them out and that were not flexible and didn't evolve. So it's, it's, a, real, it's a real challenge now, isn't it? To get both see funds go to those institutions, but then see the leaders in them embrace the responsibility of growing something. It can last. So you talked about this in terms of nonprofits. In my corporate work, I find the same dynamic. People who are trying to lead and promote racial justice in their organization. Literally, I was just talking with a client 
and I said, who was saying that uh, he was having trouble retaining volunteers to work on this internal program that he had started. And I said, we talked about it. Where do you keep the shared documents? Do you have the procedures written out? Do yeah. people know what to do when they show up? Is it written out? Do they have to reinvent the wheel all the time? Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, we, this, it's too easy for people to treat equity and justice all as some sort of cotton candy type thing. It's sort of a feel good thing. It's sweet. It's nice. We spin it and we move on. And it, and the, Yes, I, I do respect people who are embracing this, but it's much like our shift to appreciative inquiry. You do not get to do it in one department. <laughs> it's not a departmental, it's not an initiative, it's a full-blown uh, really scrubbing of the organization to reconstitute the way it operates. So fairness is built into every single practice and process. And yeah. Who wants to undergo that? I mean, people, you know, but it, I'm seeing more people saying, oh, my God. Well, I, one organization I work with said, you know, really held back from issuing the big statement when we were uh, coming to terms with the murder of George Floyd. Um, they held back and they said, you know, this time, instead of a big statement, we need to look at ourselves first. And I, I felt like I did feel a certain hallelujah feeling like, yes, because we don't need you, you know, if you're a healthcare system or you're a bank or an educational institution, we don't need you to become a social just, justice expert. We need you to bank fairly with people of color. We need you to bank in a way that undoes the built-in inequities that you inherited, that you adopt, whether it's credit scores or other things that you implement over and over again that reinforce oppression. We need you to scrub that. Be fair bankers, you know? So it was, it was you know, again, I, I, it's part of my nature to look for where are people getting it right? And I thought that moment when somebody says, instead of issuing a statement, we need to look at ourselves. Ah, yes, yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> this is not, you know, this is not a diversity campaign where you just prop up a message and put someone uh, with a beautiful face out there to say something nice. Um, this is you. Part of my nature, I'm going to repeat what you just said. Part of my nature is to look for where people get it right. Yeah, yes. Um, and again, this is not, I am not uh, you know, some Pollyanna person that says, oh, but look at us improving. Um, I just know that if we're to learn to do better, that we learn by watching others do better. And then when I surface an example of how people make a transition from dysfunction to a fairer, more functional way of working, that others will learn from that. So we, you know, we end up with the responsibility of surfacing people, getting it right, telling the story. Um, and, I'm, and I've heard you do this so many times, Jean, tell the story of how people got from here to there. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, um, it's the awakening. Yeah. And then the change behavior. So. Okay. So we, uh, we need to close this out, but I do want you to tell people what you're doing now because it's fascinating. And really, I focus now on working with studying, working with researching, teaching, about strategies that we are using to help people who have to rebuild their lives. These are the people that in some way have been shipwrecked by war or weather, loss of health or wealth, and find themselves 
um, washed up on an unfamiliar shore are trying to rebuild their lives. And um, I've always been really riveted by the capacity that people have to recreate lives out of their imagination, this sort of amazing human capacity. And um, so focusing on that in an era of upheaval, which is what I call this time we're in now, where one thing after another threatens our uh, sense of security and our notion about what is reliable and what can be taken for granted. I think it's a good time for us to understand people who have found their way through the unthinkable and to understand better the wisdom they have about what it means to rebuild your life. So I've been so many different places now in the world and I've been with people in what we all would think the direst circumstances, right? And so I'm always looking for what is universal. I mean, it's sort of an anthropological approach. And what is universal? It's the universal hungers, um, which I just sort of sum up as earn, learn, belong. You know, the desire we all have to offer something to the world, the world values, to have an exchange that's based on um, work that we think will matter in the world or will be deemed valuable by others. The, the desire to learn, not, none of us wants to be treated as a finished product. You know, we all want to, to see ourselves as evolving people with capacity to grow and acquire new skills. And then fundamentally wanting to belong, wanting to be able to walk on the ground, to, to feel welcomed on the ground that we stand upon, to believe that um, we can have a shared um, experience with people around us. So earn, learn, belong became my shorthand for describing these human aspirations and also the challenges that we try to resolve and solve after catastrophic events. I mean, I think now Maker Ripley has um, trademarked that, but earn, learn, belong for me are universal hungers. They're, they're in Zadari, the camp for Syrian refugees in the desert in Jordan. They were in the shelters Germany created for displaced Syrians. They're in Lebanon in the oldest refugee camp in the world. They were in the neighborhoods of New Orleans. As I stood there with neighborhood leaders after Katrina, they're in, in, you know, we want as human beings um, contribute to learn, to be connected. These are, this is universal. And the human spirit is not extinguishable. Not by fires or floods or pandemics or inequities or brutal systems. We, the spark does not go out. And so, uh, so there we are with the job to tend it, to mind it. So thank you, Angela Blanchard. This has been highly informative. I am deeply moved by what you just said. <laughs> I feel you always get me into trouble of some sort, Jean, by making me tell. I mean, there's something of value. I end up saying all the words. <laughs> okay, so tell people how they can find you. Um, so Angela at AngelaBlanchard.com. That's the best way. Okay, and I'm going, we mentioned some names. I'm going to put have those names put down in the notes. We mentioned Felix uh, Frager, Tim Skaggs, and Ann Hilvick. And so I'll put those names down just so people can know what you just said. And I certainly thank you for your time. And I do plan to invite you back at some point to talk specifically about your fascinating work with uh, helping 
people and communities rebuild their lives in disaster areas. So thank you kindly. Thanks for being my friend all these years, Jean. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hello again. Hearing Angela talk about her work never fails to inspire me. When I introduced her, I referred to two of her values that I thought were particularly key. I want to emphasize them again here. The first was her deep and abiding respect for the capacity of people to grow and flourish. She talked about in the early days at Baker Ripley, they were required by funders to detail what was broken in the communities they served. At that time, the focus was on diagnose the problem, fix the problem. That's how you got funds and support. After getting sick and tired of focusing on what was wrong, she and staff focused, decided to adopt appreciative inquiry as the philosophy for Baker Ripley's community work. She pointed out, this does not mean they shut down discussion about what was broken or flawed. Instead, using appreciative inquiry, and I'm quoting her here, what do we have to do? What do we have to work with in the way of strengths and resources, power, et cetera, that can be activated and arranged in a way that allows us to free ourselves from the things that are not working. I just love that. The second value that she holds is understanding how everything is connected. She gets systems. Operationally, this means that she and the staff worked hard to build an infrastructure at Baker Ripley that would support the services they wanted to provide to the community. She showed us her model that put infrastructure as the platform on which services were built. She didn't say it here, but her mantra throughout the years when we would talk is that the business of delivering services and the service themselves are intertwined. This is important for those who are committed to leadership in the racial and social justice arena. It's not just about the good we do. It's about having the platform and organization on which to do the good. Thank you for listening. Please check out Pathfinders, our membership program. You can find it on our website. Also, we would love it if you would subscribe to our blog and tell others about it.